So you studied, you took the test, and now you're a licensed ham radio operator. Congratulations, welcome to the hobby. There are so many fun and fascinating things you can do with an amateur radio license. One of those you may have heard of is amateur radio satellites. You may have studied about them, read about them while you were studying to take your exam. You may have heard other hams talk about it, but you've got questions. How do you get into them? What equipment do you need? Things like that. Well, today I'd like to answer a few of those questions and help you get started. But first, let me say, I am in no way the end-all expert in amateur radio satellites. I am not the guru, but I do know a few things. I've worked a few of these birds or amateur radio satellites. I've logged a few contacts. So I do believe I have some information that I'd just like to share with all of you. So please stay tuned as I go over some of the key points and maybe answer some of the questions you may have regarding amateur satellites. Amateur radio satellites are a fun aspect of the hobby. They allow 2 meter and 70 centimeter communication via basically a repeater in the sky. And much like your terrestrial repeaters here on Earth that allow you to have a greater communication range, due to their altitude, these repeaters in the sky allow you to have a much greater communication range. You can even log DX contacts using these amateur radio satellites. So there's different types of satellites and there's different ways to communicate using these satellites. Some satellites are FM satellites. Other satellites, known as the linear satellites, will allow sideband or CW communication, while other satellites even yet allow digital communication. So you can send packet or APERS messages via these satellites. One thing to note is amateur satellites are low Earth orbit satellites, meaning there's a very short window from the time they come up over the horizon until they go back down. That's in contrast to some of the satellites you may be familiar with, such as your TV satellites or GPS satellites. Let me tell you something. It'd be hard to watch a TV show if you had to be out there moving the satellite dish as, it, as the satellite moved across the sky. Kind of reminds me of when I was a kid and every time I changed the channel, you might have to get up and adjust those rabbit ears. But those satellites where you don't have to adjust, where they're stationary in the sky, those are called geostationary satellites. On the, con on the contrary, these low Earth orbit satellites, like I said, move very fast across the sky. And the satellite pass usually lasts in the 10 minute range, give or take, and that's dependent on the satellite as well as the elevation of the satellite as it crosses the sky. The organization that helps design, build, and launch these satellites is AMSAT. Our local AMSAT office is AMSAT North America located in Kensington, Maryland, and there's other affiliated AMSAT organizations across the globe as well. AMSAT gives different satellites an OSCAR designation. You may have heard of OSCAR. OSCAR stands for Orbital Satellite Carrying Amateur Radio. The first OSCAR satellite was OSCAR-1, launched in 1961. Today, there's many satellites that amateurs use. Some of them include the FM satellites, SO-50, AO-91, AO-92, the linear satellites, CAST-3A, CAST-3B, CAST-3F, as well as the digital satellites, Falcon Sat 3, as well as the International Space Station. That's right, the International Space Station has ham radio gear that you can access from the ground and send messages to other people across the globe. Now this is just a short list of amateur radio satellites. It's no way all encompassing. There's many more out there, but these are a few I'm familiar with and a few I think people are most familiar with as well.
While great big base stations with dual axis rotors and high power radios can make using the satellites and getting into the satellites and making those QSOs a little bit easier, sometimes that equipment is cost prohibitive to the new hams or people just getting into the hobby. For those that have base stations and those wishing to set up base stations, some of the popular radios are the ICOM IC910, which is discontinued, the ICOM IC9700, which is in current production and I believe will be a very popular radio for satellite use in these base station scenarios, and the Kenwood TS2000, which was a fantastic radio, but unfortunately it's discontinued as well. But there are other options out there as well that you can get and they're great radios and maybe you can find something that has a little bit of age on it if you want to set up a base station that isn't going to break the bank. A common antenna that many people use for these larger base stations that they set up is the M2 antenna, the Leo Pack. Now this antenna is used in conjunction with the elevation azimuth rotator so that you can easily track the satellites as they move across the sky. Now, to easily do this, you certainly want to have a computer as well as uh, some software. And AMSAT actually sells some software, SATPC32, that you can get. You can download it for free, but if you want to register it, you can pay uh, using the AMSAT uh, website. And that software will link to your radio, it will link to your antenna rotator, and not only control the rig, and adjust the frequencies, but it will also track that satellite as it goes across the sky, which is really cool. Now many hams that are just getting into the satellites use a simple radio such as a Baofeng. The nice thing about the Baofeng is not going to break the bank. What's it cost? 20, 30, maybe $40? You're not going to be out of a lot of money. A lot of hams use them and most of us already have one, so you don't have to go out and buy a special radio. The only problem with this radio is it will only operate in simplex mode. You cannot use it full duplex. That means you can't hear yourself being received back from the satellite. So you're not, you, you're not really sure if you're getting into it. But that's just a small price to pay. And like I said, many hams use these Baofeng radios to operate these satellites. Now with that being said, there are HTs out there that will operate full duplex. The Kenwood THD72 will do it, and uh, that's actually the radio I have. So it's really nice to be able to uh, key up the mic, uh, put out your call sign, make a QSO, and be able to hear yourself coming back from the satellite so you know you're getting into it. One of the most common antennas used for satellite operations is the Aero antenna. The Aero 2 satellite antenna runs around $100 if you want to get it without the optional duplexer. But without the duplexer, you'll need to operate with two radios. Many times I see it used with uh, two HTs or two FT817s or FT818s uh, to do it. Uh, or you can pay about $150 for the antenna and it comes with a duplexer if you want to just be using one radio. So it does cost a little bit more if you want to be using just a single radio. Another piece of equipment that I almost said it was optional, but looking back, I don't believe it's optional. I think it's a must have is a smartphone. You're going to need a smartphone to show you where the satellite is in the sky. There's some great apps out there. I use ISS detector. But this app will give you alerts as to when the pass is about to start and it will actually show you in the sky where the satellite is so you can track it. You know, these things are moving across the sky. You're, you've got to move your antenna with it. So I, a smartphone is uh, indispensable. You've got to have a smartphone with a good app to show you where the satellite is in the sky. Other optional equipment include a digital voice recorder. Why do you need a digital voice recorder? Well, think about it. Like I said, these passes last about 10 minutes. The QSOs are coming quick. You got an HT in one hand, you got a satellite in the other. How are you gonna log your contact? I got two arms, I need four, but you only got two. So having a voice recorder and being able to record the pass and go back afterwards and 
listen to it and record and log all your QSOs. I think that's a very important thing to have. It's optional. You don't have to have it. But I think, uh, I know I need one. I can't remember all the QSOs afterwards. I've got to have that voice recorder. And the last thing, again, is optional. I like to have a headset. I think it's easier for me to hear uh, the, the, the satellite with it right here versus having the speaker out here. Um, it's just helpful and uh, having a headset with a boom mic. I can even clip the radio to my belt and I have a little button that I can strap to my finger and I can use one hand on the satellite and hit the or satellite antenna and hit the button at the same time and uh, track that satellite. So I can kind of keep this hand free for anything else I might need it for. So some things to consider when you're working satellites and the biggest one is the Doppler. Many of us remember from high school, middle school, whenever you learned about the Doppler effect is uh, it affects frequency of waves uh, for moving objects in relation to stationary ob objects. The thing I remember most about school when we learned about Doppler was the train. As the train's approaching you, what's happening to the sound of that horn? It sounds higher, okay, because the, the waves are being compressed and it's causing the frequency to go up as that train is approaching you. As the train passes you, what happens? That horn goes, why does it go, why does the tone go lower? Because as it's moving away from you, those, those waves are expanded, so the frequency goes down. The same thing happens to radio waves on a satellite. As the satellites come into you, those radio frequencies are compressed. The frequency goes up. Those radio waves are compressed and the frequency goes up. And as the satellite goes by and passes you, the opposite happens. Those frequencies are expanded. The radio waves are expanded rather and the frequency goes down. So one thing to keep in mind, since 70 centimeters is more affected uh, by Doppler than two meter, you generally don't need to adjust your two meter frequencies on these satellites, but the 70 centimeter will usually always have to be adjusted. All right. Now, when I first got into the amateur satellites, I knew what Doppler was. I'd heard of it before. I remember it from physics or whatever high school class, college class it was. I understood Doppler. But how to compensate it for it for amateur satellites? Uh, I had to I had to think about it and get it all set in my head because it took a bit. But if you if you think about it, it's a pretty easy concept to grasp and it's easy to figure out what you need to do. So like I said, it's really really noticeable on the 70 centimeter band. Don't have to worry about it too much on the two meter band. But on 70 centimeters, let's just say on uh, a 70 centimeter uplink. That means you're transmitting up to the satellite on 70 centimeters and that satellite's coming to you. What's that doing to the frequency? It's compressing the wavelength. So it's causing the frequency to go up. So you'll need to compensate by turning the frequency on your radio down so that it will offset that Doppler shift. And as the satellite goes past you, what's happening? That wavelength is being expanded. The frequency is going down. So you need to adjust back up so you can still get into that satellite. It's listening on a certain frequency. And if you're too far off, you're going to sound scratchy or distorted or not get in clearly or maybe not even get in at all. So you want to be sure you adjust for Doppler. Now, that's a little bit different if the 70 centimeter band is the downlink. So when you're listening on your radio and the satellite is transmitting on 70 centimeter, again, it's coming at you. You're listening at a certain frequency. The wavelength is getting compressed. It seems like its frequency is going up. You need to adjust your radio up to hear it. It's opposite uplink downlink. 
on the downlink, you need to adjust up as it's approaching because you're listening for a higher frequency. You need to adjust up. As it passes you, you need to be listening for a lower frequency, so you need to adjust down. Exact opposite of the uplink versus the downlink. I hope that's clear. Like I said, when I was first getting into the amateur satellites, I was a little confused with the uplink, downlink, how to adjust. Like I said, I understood the concept of Doppler, but I uh, hope that explanation kind of clears it up for you if you're new and you don't know what to do. Another thing to consider, and we've already talked about this, is they move. You got to track it. So. I use an app on my phone called ISS Detector, and you can download it for free. You can pay for it. I think um, it gives you more options if you pay for it. I know I paid for mine. Uh, but you can tell it what satellites you want to be notified on, and as a satellite's about to come over the horizon, it will send you a message or a notification saying it's about to pass over the horizon. It will show you a compass and a needle and as you turn, that compass will move, the needle will move, it will point at the satellite so you can know which direction the satellite is. This is the software or the app I use on my phone. This is ISS Detector. And right now we've got an AO92 pass going overhead. And the green line represents the path it's going to be going. And as you can see, as I move around the room, uh, it's a you know, it's got the built-in compass so you can kind of get the idea of where it is And I don't know if you can see it. But there's a little dot Right there the arrow tells you which way to point so we go over here and There's that dot the arrow is pointing to the south So that kind of gives us an idea of where to point the antenna There's a little circle and when that circle is on top of the dot just like that, your phone is pointed directly up at the uh, satellite. Again, you see that circle there. And we move it over, put it over the dot, and your phone is pointed up at, the end of the phone up here is pointed up at the satellite. So this is a great app, tells you exactly where to point your antenna as the satellite moves across the sky. Some good information here tells you how long the satellite's been over the horizon, seven minutes, 25 seconds. And we have three minutes and 50 seconds left of the pass. Uh, you can hit details on this app and it will tell you various other information, start time, uh, end time, where the satellite is. As you see, the satellite's kind of going over the Yucatan Peninsula and it gives you speed and direction, elevation, all of that stuff right here on this app. So uh, there are other apps out there to use, but I do prefer the ISS detector. I think this is a great app to use to track satellites as well as the ISS. And various, various other things you can see in the sky too. You can uh, select it to do all kinds of different things uh, in the settings and it will alert you when these uh, objects in the sky will pass overhead. The other dots you see there are, uh, you got the sun, uh, the moon will be on there. Those are probably planets. Yeah, I see one with a, looks like rings around it. That's probably Saturn, a circle with a red dot on it. That's gotta be Jupiter. So you can see the uh, other planets there as well. So really cool app. And uh, this is one I would recommend if you're wanting to get into satellite operations. There's other satellite tracking software or apps out there for your phones. There's some for computers too, but I really do like and I recommend the ISS detector. I think, personally, it's the best one out there. And the last thing to consider as the satellite is passing overhead is it tumbles in space. So it's got little antennas on it and they're moving. They're tumbling. And if you remember back from your licensing and studying, uh, antennas that are 
out of phase, vertical or horizontal, out of polarization rather, not phase, but uh, mismatched on the polarization, uh, you lose some of the signal. So you'll see a lot of ham radio operators doing this when they're getting into the birds. That's because that satellite is tumbling in space and they're, they're turning and as the si you can actually hear the signal increase when you get to the sweet spot. And as it moves, it's tumbling. So you have to make that adjustment as well. So the tumbling factor, the tracking factor, the listening factor, the Doppler factor, there's a lot that goes on when you're making contacts on these amateur radio satellites. It's very challenging, but it's very fun. And it's very rewarding when you start making the contacts because of all the things you have to keep track of. It's just really, really rewarding when you start making those contacts, especially some longer distance contacts. So let's get outside. Let me show you some of the equipment I use for amateur radio satellites. All right, this is the equipment I use. This is a little uh, Pelican style box that I keep my uh, radio gear in. And then this is the antenna. This is actually a log periodic antenna that I made. And you can make your own antenna as well. But many hams that are just getting started may not be interested in making their own. And the aero antenna is a great option as well. Another antenna that is going to be a log periodic antenna that some hams use is the elk antenna. And that is a great antenna as well. So there's lots of options out there whether you like to buy your antenna or if you wish to make an antenna, you could certainly do that as well. All right, so this is everything all wired up. Got the Kenwood THD72. It's got a little push to talk button right here. And then this mess of wires with various splitters and adapters uh, go to the headset as well as the digital voice recorder and then the coax going to the antenna. This is a little bit more complex than what you actually have to have. Like I said previously, you could do this with a simple Baofeng radio and an antenna and forget about all this other stuff. You could absolutely do that. But I like the convenience of the headset and the voice recorder and the dual band duplexing radio. So as I'm transmitting, I can hear myself coming back down uh, on the downlink as well. So I know I'm getting into that uh, satellite repeater. This is a nice little setup. It does cost a little bit more than your Baofeng and your uh, simple antenna, but uh, it doesn't cost as much as those big base stations either. So I like to think of it as a nice compromise. It does get me out of the house and it get me on the satellites um, in a portable setting, which I love portable radio. So uh, this works well for me and I really do have fun with this. So as you see, this is kind of how I wear everything. It's got a, a mess of wires down here that kind of hang from me, but uh, I've got the push to talk button here and I can hold the push to talk and the radio with, or the antenna with one hand. As I point to the satellite, as it moves across the sky, I can also adjust for the spin and I can hit this push to talk button right here and activate my push to talk. I keep my saddle, I keep my radio on the other hip here on my left hip so I can use this hand and turn the frequency and adjust for the Doppler effect. So there's a lot going on. That's why I think the headset and the voice recorder are a really important thing. Don't have to have them, uh, but they certainly are important. So you can activate the satellite uh, with the push to talk, make that QSO, adjust for Doppler, track the satellite. And what I usually do with my phone is I'll have it sitting either down on the ground or sitting on a table nearby so I can watch it 
and uh, see where the satellite is as it goes by. All right, now that you've seen some of the equipment I use for working these amateur radio satellites, let's show you how it's done. See how easy it is? So I hope this answers some of your questions you may have had. And I hope that I've gotten a few people interested in the amateur radio satellites. Yes, you can have expensive stations, but many hams begin operating the satellites using just a modest investment. Satellite operations can be a challenge. It does take some skill and take some practice, but with a little work and when those contacts start coming in, it really is a blast. So everybody, thanks for watching in 73. Until next time, this is Bob, KK4DIV. Bye-bye.